What do you think are some of the most significant changes that Christianity has wrought in the culture that we live in today? Well, there are so many. Yeah. That, <laughs> that it's it's all. I mean, that's a kind of very difficult question because there are so many. But I, I would I, I would say to to look at the most obvious one because it's the symbol of 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 Christianity. Um, if you look at the cross, it's such an odd thing to have as a kind of focus of veneration and to have as a kind of fundamental symbol of a civilization, um, because a cross is an emblem of torture. It's a, it, 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 and to the Romans, it was an emblem of their power to torture to death their inferiors. So crucifixion was inflicted on um, on those who opposed Roman power in provinces. Um, but it's also the, uh, the paradigmatic fate that is visited on slaves who rebel against their masters. Mm. And you know, everyone who's seen Spartacus will remember the, the great line of crosses lining the Appian Way. Uh, these are billboards advertising the ability of Rome to crush rebellion by the weak. Um, and so therefore it serves as a symbol of the, of, of, of the power over, of the powerful over the powerless. Now Christianity absolutely upends that it says, actually, uh, the cross is a symbol of the powerless triumphing over the powerful. It's the symbol of the, the slave triumphing over the master, um, of the victim triumphing over the torturer. And this is such a radical notion that it's hard adequately to express how radical it is. Um, and the idea that the last shall be first that there is an inherent dignity and value and indeed power in being a victim. Uh, this is something that would have been utterly bewildering to the Romans. And it, it takes a kind of long time for first the Roman world and then the world of the kind of Germanic conquerors in the West and, and, and so on to, to, to properly synthesize and, 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 and understand it. Uh, and that's why I think it, in a way, we are so habituated to it that, that it takes an effort to understand just how weird, just how strange that idea is. And it's why, actually, I think the, the, the modern who has most profoundly and unsettlingly understood just how radical that idea is, how radical the idea that the cross of all things should become the emblem of a new civilization, was a man who was um, not just an atheist, but a radically hostile anti-Christian atheist, Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche said, this is a repellent thing. Nietzsche identified with the power and the glory and the beauty of classical civilization. And he thought that Christianity notoriously was a religion for slaves. And he saw in the emblem of Christ nailed to the cross, a kind of disgusting subversion of the ideals of the classical world, a privileging of those who properly should be ground beneath the heels of the mighty. And he saw it as a kind of sickness that then, you know, it kind of infected the blonde beast, as he called it, that this, uh, you know, the primordial figure of the warrior gets corrupted and and turned into a, a monk, a monkish figure who's sick with poverty and sympathy for the poor and the oppressed. And Nietzsche saw, thought it was disgusting. Now, those ideas, however vulgarized, um, of course, feed into by. A, a, a very septic sump, which is that of, of fascism. Yeah. And fascism, I think, was the most radical and revolutionary movement that uh, Europe has seen since the age of Constantine. Because unlike the French Revolution, unlike the Russian Revolution, it doesn't only target institutional Christianity, it targets the moral and ethical fundamentals of Christianity. Because the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, are still preaching that idea that the victim should be raised up from the dust and that the oppressor should be humbled into the dust. It's still preaching the idea that the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, just as Christ had done. The Nazis do not buy into that. The Nazis buy into the Nietzschean idea that uh, the weak are weak and should be treated as weak, as contemptible, as something to be crushed. And I think the horror of that for us in the post-war world um, is the measure of how profoundly Christian we remain. And one of the reasons, I think, why institutional Christianity fades in the wake of the Second World War is that, in a sense, fascism, Nazism, 
gives us an alternative myth, but it's still a very Christian one. The fact that um, Hitler has replaced Satan and uh, Auschwitz has replaced hell doesn't alter the fact that we understand Nazism to be the quintessence of evil for deeply, deeply Christian reasons. That's an interesting perspective. I'm sure you're right. A um, little known sort of factoid from history is that uh, the first time that Mussolini met Hitler, he gave him a leather bound set of Nietzsche's writings. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. And it's really significant to my way of thinking because I think, uh, as you say, he loathed Christianity, but he was very aware that its collapse might have much deeper consequences yeah. than the other, if I can use this word, trendy atheists of the day realised. I yeah. wonder whether we're still not grappling with what's no, really we're not. left. We're not, we're not at all. Uh, and the reason for that is precisely the way in which Nietzsche's philosophy fed into, into fascism. Mm. Um, uh, so Nietzsche, Nietzsche was particularly contemptuous of, um, uh, of English liberals. Uh, he saw it as a peculiarly kind of English disease. So I'm sure he would, would have included Australians under that umbrella. Um, and and he, was, he was contemptuous of the idea that he associated with, with kind of people like George Eliot, that um, you could get rid of Christian belief, but still have the kind of superstructure of, um, uh, you know, Christian ideals and Christian philosophy and Christian teachings and Christian assumptions. Um, and I think that he would, you know, if he were alive today, he would be as contemptuous of Richard Dawkins or A.C. Grayling, um, as he was of George Eliot. And he would say of, of both of them and of most atheists in the West today that they are basically Christians. Uh, you know, Nietzsche saw humanists, communists, liberals, people who may have defined themselves against Christianity as being absolutely in the fundamentals Christian. And I think he's, you know, I think he's right about that because I think that um, in a sense, so much of, of, you know, there's a sense in which atheism that doesn't repudiate the kind of the ethics and the morals and the values of Christianity is really simply a logical endpoint of a trend within Protestantism. It's, and indeed Christianity generally, because, you know, going right the way back to the Hebrew prophets, you know, who precede Christianity, what they are preaching is a kind of desacralization of the world. They look at springs and trees and mountaintops and they say there are no gods there. There are no spirits there. Uh, you know, this is just stock and stone. God is up there. Uh, and this is something that obviously Christians inherit so that when, you know, Christian missionaries go out into the dripping woods of Saxony, they chop down the, you know, the great trees that are sacred to the Norse gods, the Nordic gods, the Germanic gods, and say, look, these are just trees. Yeah. And they chop them up and turn them into chapels. Um, and in a sense, what then happens in the Reformation, when you get Protestant reformers looking at the Catholic Church and saying, well, this is all just hocus pocus. This is mumbo jumbo. This is ludicrous magic. Uh, we, must, um, you know, we, must, we must get rid of this kind of magical thinking. We must restore the church to its kind of natural purity. That sense that um, superstition must be banished, that idols must be overthrown, is something that, of course, in the long run, will be picked up by by uh, by atheist radicals. But you know, whether it's in the in, in the French Revolution or whether it's in kind of new atheist movement in the twenty first century, they're still basically cleaving to the kind of the fundamental Christian ideas. It's just and and, and the very idea that you should you know banish superstition, get rid of, of, of idols, that doing that will bring you into enlightenment, that the people who walk in darkness will, be, will, will see a great light. I mean, this is a kind of Christian idea through and through. And as I say, I think it's, I think the, the idea that having banished, you know, the supernatural from springs and trees, you end up banishing the supernatural from everything is a kind of logical endpoint. Yes. And imagining that banishing them will somehow bring you to, to truth. Right. Well, if we can we backtrack a moment to the cross, and you talked about yeah. it, it symbolised a whole lot of things that were very radical. I agree with that. I mean, I actually think Christianity is astonishingly radical. And one, it's always amused me that a lot of people say, oh, Christians are so conservative. Actually, what they believe in is radical beyond belief. And most radical is, in fact, that aspect of the image of the cross 
particularly when it's empty, there's no body on it, is this idea, you know, that Christians think history matters and they actually believe that God in human form not only died on that cross, but he left it and rose again. And the uh, polling I've seen in Australia is quite amazing that even to this day, and Australia is a very secular country, 40% of Australians actually think in some form or another the resurrection happened. Not many people actually say they don't think it happened and quite a few are undecided. Thank you.